Support for Iowa Catholic Radio and Making It Personal is provided by Sarah Vocations Ministry. Learn more at joinserra.org. Making It Personal with Bishop William Johnson on Iowa Catholic Radio and iowacatholicradio.com. Welcome to Making It Personal with Bishop Johnson. I'm Kelly Mesher Collins with the Diocese of Des Moines. On today's show, we're talking about the recent Freedom to Serve Symposium, which took place April 19th at Drake University and was sponsored by a number of organizations, including the Diocese of Des Moines. Our guest today is symposium presenter Melissa Moschello. She's an associate professor of philosophy at the Catholic University of America. But before we get to today's interview, let's find out what's on the bishop's mind. Well, we bask in the Easter octave. He has right. risen just as he said. Yes, he Alleluia, <laughs> Alleluia. So mm-hmm. it's, it's great to take part in, the, in the, both the uh, Triduum uh, celebrations and, again, uh, each of the parishes uh, welcoming uh, young people in other ages, not so young people even, mm-hmm. uh, be, uh, making communion with us in the Catholic Church. Uh, the Good Friday celebration, uh, Deacon Rodrigo Mayorga Landeros gave a beautiful homily uh, during the celebration at the cathedral. And then, obviously, uh, the, the liturgies were people coming back, you know, not to still some caution with the pandemic, mm-hmm. but I think people largely, you know, are slipping beyond some of those reservations that they have. And we understand those who maybe are compromised in their health. But uh, a great privilege for me on the Easter Monday to be able to celebrate the baptism of uh, Adam and Kara Story, Kara Story's uh, youngest daughter, just born, Louisa Day Story, uh, named it Louise de Marlock and Dorothy Day at the Basilica of St. John. So that was a, a great treat for me to, to join with them and to be the minister of the church church there. Uh, she's uh, got plenty of older siblings who are willing to look after her <laughs> and show her a lot of love here as well. And then uh, made it past the tax day. Uh, hopefully you got your taxes in, Kelly. Yeah, I'm you sure and that Jason. Was <laughs> Jason handles that. That's Jason's thing. That's the division of labor for you. That's and, right. <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, good. And uh, uh, this weekend, uh, we the, the the graces of the sacred chrism for confirmation. Mm-hmm. Here we go. We're going to ride the, the old chrism trail as Bishop Connolly of Lincoln. <laughs> says, and get to head out back with the people at St. Mary's Hamburg tonight. Oh, uh, so I was exciting. there you know, a few weeks ago. Actually, our Diocesan Solidarity Fund is noted in the mirror. Uh, uh, Monsignor Hurley was out there as well as their Faith Formation Center is taking shape. They've broken ground and beginning to establish that. And parishes uh, around the diocese, helping them to realize mm-hmm. this goal, you know, that the setback of both the flooding and then the you know the, the skyrocketing cost for construction with the pandemic. So, uh, you know, presenting them with a a modest check of $200,000. So that reflects, I think, you know, the commitment and sacrifice of so many in our diocese for which we're grateful. And then uh, heading on to Imogene, St. Patrick's, so kind of spending time on the Western Front, and then back to uh, St. Thomas Aquinas in Indianola, and then celebrating the Sunday's Divine Mercy right. Sunday Mass, mm. the special mm. Mass at 3.30 p.m. at Christ the King Parish in Des Moines. So mm. uh, these are all a wonderful feasts and the inspiration of St. John Paul II for Divine Mercy Sunday. St. Faustina and all are there. We're continuing with our diocesan visioning process. Uh, we're moving much more into the kind of practical strategizing and things. We're at St. John's Greenfield tomorrow in the afternoon for that. So prior to my heading on to Imogene. Uh, so I really think things crystallizing around this sense and listening in the surveys, uh, the various consultations that have taken place to boldly cultivate encounter, friendship, and communion with Christ. Pope Francis speaks of that parousia, that boldness that we're to have, not to be timid, Mm -hmm. not to be cowed by our culture, but those who would want to kind of relegate us to to the the sidelines. We have a valid voice. I think some of our recent guests, and today I think uh, Professor Moshala is going to also kind of unpack this Mm -hmm. for us as the symposium really was exposing our freedom to to give witness and to be fully participating in civil society as well. But uh, those priorities of inspiring youth and our young adults, uh, inviting and welcome people to our communities, mm-hmm. uh, clearly, boldly articulating our Catholic teaching and communicating that. That sends a range of social teaching and our, uh, the, the wonders of the sacraments and all that were there, our, our view of our, our common home and the care that we're to have for that common home and, and all that goes in that. And then adult faith formation. Our, you know, you don't have it, you can't share it. And so how to maybe a generation that didn't uh, profit from the, the, the best uh, catechetical and other formative experiences. And so how can our focus there, whether one's parents, to, so that one is equipped to, to really witness and form children and others. So these are part of our visioning goals. But the, 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 the cash value is in what can we do for this you know, in, in concrete ways. We're going to take a quick break. We'll talk to Melissa Moschello. You're listening to Making a Personal with Bishop Johnson. 
Welcome to Making It Personal with Bishop Johnson. I'm Kelly Mesher Collins with the Diocese of Des Moines. On today's show, we're talking about the Freedom to Serve Symposium, which was held April 19th at Drake University. Our guest today is, was symposium presenter Melissa Moschello, Associate Professor of Philosophy at the Catholic University of America. Her research and teaching focus on natural law, biomedical ethics, and the family. She's also author of To Whom Do Children Belong? Parental Rights, Civic Education, and Children's Autonomy, as well as in numerous scholarly articles. And uh, the talks and the articles are voluminous. Uh, the Bishop Johnson, welcome Professor Muscala to be with us this morning. I really appreciate you making time and with a very uh, full load of your life, too. So uh, just as you know, you, you've landed at, at the Catholic University of America, a place near and dear to my heart as well. Uh, did you envision this as your trajectory led you from Harvard to Santa Croce, Princeton and beyond? Uh, just how how did this unfold and how was your faith a, a, an, an ingredient in this or is that something that came to full flower? Sure. Well, you know, it's a it's a it's a long story, but I, um, uh, you know, I came to, to really uh, take my faith seriously um, only in high school uh, as I was, you know, exploring that and got involved in some church youth groups and kind of lay uh, lay uh, Catholic movements, and and so I, I always wanted to really dive deeper into understanding things. And as I as I did that, and came across, you know, great explanations, and was directed to you know read the Catechism and and really really dive in uh, to you know there's such a rich intellectual tradition in the Catholic faith that you know the more I explored, the more. Uh, I was convinced, you know, and and sold on it, and and just saw the beauty of it, and also found it so compelling, um, personally and and intellectually. And uh, so I knew, you know, going into college that, that my faith, you know, would play an important role. I obviously didn't know where I was going to end up, but um, you know, a number of things led me to think that the the best way that I could ultimately serve society and and the church was um, through, you know, my intellectual talent uh, and, and trying to go into uh, teaching and research, uh, you know, preferably at the university level. And so, you know, that was that was kind of my desired uh, trajectory. And, you know, getting a university job is not an easy thing. <laughs> and uh, getting a job in, in philosophy is not an easy thing. You know, I, I, I would joke, it's almost like, you know, the Supreme Court, you know, <laughs> a position opens up when somebody dies or retires, you know. Um, what what are there, like 12, 12 so. <laughs> uh, people seeking jobs for every open position or something? I mean, yeah. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> so I was really blessed um, to be, you know, getting on the job market at a time when when Catholic University uh, had open spots in philosophy. It's just a wonderful program, and, you know, I... I really consider every single one of my colleagues a friend, somebody that I trust. It's, it's a complete absence of a lot of the political infighting that is so typical in academic departments in which, you know, I experienced uh, myself, you know, in, in graduate school and was there as an undergrad, though I wasn't really cognizant of it. Mm. Uh, so so it's been a real blessing to be here. And also, I mean, I spent, you know, I spent a year uh, in the midst of my time at at uh, at Catholic University, I, I took a year leave of absence uh, to go over to Columbia University in the medical school, doing some work on on biomedical ethics. And I wasn't sure if that was going to be a permanent move or or not. Um, but after being there for a year, um, I realized it was just not the right fit for an, uh, for many reasons. Um, but uh, but coming back to CUA, uh, especially after the the year at at Columbia, I also appreciated to such a great extent the genuine academic freedom. Uh, that we have here. I mean, given that I work on a lot of very controversial contemporary topics, um, I realized how how limited I felt in in what I could say and what I could publish uh, when I was at uh, when I was at Columbia, uh, at least in terms of you know fear of how that would impact my career and the possibility of tenure. And and at CUA, you know, I don't have that that fear, and so that's is, really wonderful. It's isn't one that of the part of the irony? Go ahead. It is. It's one of the few universities where you can actually debate, you know, these these really difficult, sensitive issues 
um, and not get canceled, uh, you know, let alone fired <laughs> right, for, mm-hmm. for even daring to, to challenge the orthodoxies on this. So I'm very, very grateful to be here. Yeah, I mean, that you didn't have to wait until you got tenure to, to know what you really think about things. You exactly. Know? But exactly. The, yeah, that is the, the sorry irony that the, the intolerance that prevails, you know, in, under the guise of academic freedom, but yes, really the yeah. kind of ideologies that uh, will try and stamp out and, as you say, you know, cancel other voices uh, that might be part of that. Right. So the true collegiality that you enjoy, but we could we could go on and on about that. But uh, uh, you know, in uh, you know, I do know the, the the transition. You know, kind of political philosophy, uh, perhaps some mentorship with Professor Robert George at Princeton, and right? Right. right. For that. Now, did he insist that you learn the banjo? Was that part of uh, you know? Was that de rigueur <laughs> for his graduate students? <laughs> Nice. I, I I tried to pick up the guitar at some point, but uh, you know it just it, it it didn't quite take. I can play a few chords. I do play the piano, and I've enjoyed you know often after the the kind of annual James Madison program conference that 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 uh, Robbie George heads up. You know there will the last night. There's always a. Uh, a long-awaited, you know, session uh, uh, after the closing dinner with 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 Robbie on the banjo and and people singing folk songs, and that's wonderful. So, yeah, he's, yeah. Whether he's Father Thomas Joseph White's part of that or not. Um, so, <laughs> yes. political philosophy, but bioethics. Are you kind of a self-made bioethicist, or was that something that you know emerged? I mean, those two aren't natural uh, bed partners, if you will. I mean, that uh, you know, I think any good philosopher should be able to apply it in in any field. But can you just talk about that? kind of uh, emergence sure uh well so i mean i yeah my my degree was you know in political philosophy so um but it was you know princeton's political uh theory program is very very philosophical so really you know literally about half of my courses were actually in the philosophy department and then you know working with with robbie george as a as a mentor, and uh, you know, he, he's just a preeminent scholar on on natural law, and has written, you know, many many important things related to bioethical issues. So it was a kind of a side thing in some ways uh, to be, you know, learning uh, learning from Robbie uh, and and through you know conferences and seminars and so on, um, more kind of informal learning about the bioethical things and and kind of going deep into learning about natural law both through formal coursework and uh, and through you know other other kinds of conferences and and things that uh, that were organized at Princeton so um, so yeah I mean in a way you know bioethics is just ethics but it's applied to you know these very concrete and, and often difficult um, specific cases um, so yeah, so I approached that, you know, from the natural law tradition, um, which you know it kind of gives a sense of you know of their objective uh, criteria for what's morally right and wrong, and that the what what's morally right and wrong isn't disconnected from what's good for human beings. In fact, it's it's really all about recognizing you know what is objectively good and fulfilling for human beings, what is actually conducive to human flourishing, and acting in ways that are fully respectful of that. Um, for all, for all people, um, and then of course with bioethics, you know, one of the huge questions becomes, well, who counts as a person, right? <laughs> who counts as a, who counts, right? In your in your moral considerations, you know, does the embryo count? Does the unborn count? Does the does the elderly, you know, with Alzheimer's uh, count? And and so then there are a lot of you know metaphysical and anthropological right. questions that need to be answered there. Amen. Um, and you know, to you understand make reference the to dignity those. of human life, you know, from conception to natural death. Amen. You um, know, and we were pri- it, yeah, privileged to have yeah. Professor Charles Camosi a few weeks ago, and uh, again, oh, he's yeah, wonderful. Yes, yes. yes. But your focus yes. here, and thank you for gracing us by coming to Des Moines and uh, Drake University hosting us. But this is really a collaboration, a kind of a unique collaboration between the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter Day Saints, the so-called Mormons, and the, right. the Catholic Church. The Diocese of Des Moines in terms of your sponsorship. And so, uh, you know, we had a a very, I think, robust uh, group of presenters, Stephen Collis, uh, attorney and master of fine arts at the University of Texas at Austin Law School, speaking about the freedom to serve God, constitutional foundations protecting worship. Camille Johnson, also an attorney, but the primary president of the Church of uh, Jesus Christ Latter-day Saints, freedom to serve the community, role of religious charities and volunteers. And we'll get to your topic in a second, but Kenneth Cray 
Craft uh, from Mount St. Mary Seminary and School of Theology, Freeman to Serve the Common Good, Faith in the Public Square and Public Office, and then your talk focusing on uh, freedom to serve our families, teaching and values and faith to our children. And so this has been an area of interest as well that is ever more timely as we think of yeah. you know the developments with the Virginia elections and, and other pieces there. So focusing on parents as primary educators. Right. Yeah. Right, exactly. And and as you said, a, a, a topic that has become increasingly timely, it was something that I got interested in in graduate school and was the subject of my my PhD dissertation. And then um, and then, you know, the book that that grew out of that with Cambridge University Press. And, you know, at the time, I, I, I thought it was already important and that, you know, already you could see issues with, you know, bias in the in the public schools and, and failure to fully respect and be cognizant of the primacy of parents um, as educators of their children, you know, the, the mentality sometimes of not just scholars, but, you know, very commonly uh, in the in the culture that, well, you know, once you send your kids to school, it's kind of the school's job <laughs> to educate them. And, you know, you do your thing on the side at home and just make sure that the kids do their homework and so on. But, you know, the formal education is the job of the state or of, um, you know, professional educators and and that's really getting it getting it backwards the the really the the true uh the reality of the matter is that you know parents are the ones who have that primary responsibility for the education and upbringing of their children in in every respect obviously uh, most parents are uh going to recognize that they need you know help with that to you know to some extent from from professionals um for education and uh, healthcare and and things like that, but the the job of directing that education and upbringing really belongs to the parents. So you can't just wash your hands of it when the kid uh, goes to school. Uh, it's it's really up to the parents to ensure that the school environment is the right one for the kids. That what they're learning is is true and good and helpful. Uh, that the moral environment of the school is is good. And those are all very very challenging things, especially today. Um, I mean, when I when I grew up. Uh, I, I did. I went to a public school for high school, um, and there were some challenges there, but uh, but it was but it was fine. But I, I mean, now I would be very hesitant to send a child to a public school almost anywhere, uh, given the infiltration of of ideologies that I think are very very harmful and confusing for children, uh, pretty much across the board, even in districts that you would think would be relatively conservative. Yeah. Some of the lens where I kind of come through some of these things and informed by people like Russ Hittinger and others, you know, and thinking about even Catholic social teaching in the late 19th century, Rerum and Navarum and things. But to think about societies and that, that the family is the, that the natural and most foundational society over against other societies that we might have and belong to, including the church, but that the state can easily usurp that. And, you know, I mean, obviously with the public education movement trying to ensure that the people have access to education. But it's 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 kind of a placed itself in a position that it's acting you know beyond its its competence or its authority right. in some way. Is that something you address? Yeah. Yes. Exactly. So, um, you know, the 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 key point that I try to make in my in my research is that the authority that that parents have to make decisions on behalf of their children is not somehow delegated from the state, um, but it's authority that. You know, it would exist if there were no state, if there were no government. Parents would have the obligation to look after their children and the accompanying authority to make decisions on their behalf because children are not mature enough to make uh, decisions for themselves. Um, so that's why parental authority is, is primary and uh, and prior to the authority of the state rather than, you know, secondary to or derived from the state's authority. Um, and that's also why you could say parents' authority is natural, because it's not just based on law or convention, but it's based on the, the very nature of the parent-child relationship, which is the source of those um, deep bonds between parents and children that make parents, in, in some respects, you know, really irreplaceable to their children and give parents um, that overarching responsibility to direct their their children's upbringing. Um, so the state obviously has a concern for children's well-being. There's a concern for future generations uh, to ensure a basic level of education so that children grow up to be law-abiding, productive citizens. There's also a kind of basic concern to make sure that children are not being abused or 
neglected, but the the role of the state is is you know subsidiary, right? It's it's meant to be a helping role, a secondary role um, that helps the parents. Uh, for instance, by ensuring that everybody has the resources to educate their child, and so you know doing that either through providing free public schools or what I think is actually better is by providing resources to parents that then they can use to send their child to whatever school uh, they think is most appropriate, um, but not coming in and, and usurping the parent's role, you know, telling the parents, well, you know, we don't, we don't care if you don't want your child to be taught X, Y, Z in the school. Um, that's what we think your child should learn. And so, uh, you know, that's our job once your child is in school. So we're not going to respect your, your objections there. I think those, that attitude is very prevalent and, and very problematic. That's a kind of a curious paternalism on the part of the state to realize through its public education. And, uh, right. you know, that, and uh, you know, I think developments, whether it's in Florida, parental rights and education, or right here in Iowa, you know, I think the, the time will tell whether the legislature has signed off on, but the movement to provide, you know, education savings accounts, uh, supporting tax credits and things like that. So, exactly. Professor, if you're willing to remain with us, we're going to take a, a little bit of a pause here. Sure. You're listening to Making Personal Bishop Johnson. Welcome back to Making a Personal with Bishop Johnson. We are back with Melissa Moskella, of who is talking about parental rights. Thank you for remaining with us, Professor. You know, you know that parents have the primary role, but that can maybe you know critics might say, well, that's rather ideal. How many of our families have to you know have two parent incomes? You know, they're working all day, immigrants. Perhaps they have not themselves had the benefit of uh, extensive education and things. Maybe they have a high school degree or other things too, and so might feel overwhelmed. You know, with this responsibility and so their own discernment. We're trying in the diocese, you know, through our ignite campaign and other things to increase the access and opportunity they'd have with the endowments. And, and other pieces that will make you know make it possible to secure our teachers and their vocational calling, but also allow parents to realize their vocational responsibilities and, and freedom in this way. You've mentioned in your book again, most recently, To Whom Do Children Belong? Parental Rights, Civic Education, and Children's Autonomy. Uh, the child protection services and the different things can really also be a source of encroachment on the parental mm-hmm. prerogative. Yeah, that's right. So, there, I mean, there are many uh, issues with the way uh, child protection services operates, um, especially issues where uh, things that ordinary loving parents uh, would not consider to be abusive or neglectful uh, can sometimes be defined as abuse or neglect, either just because of kind of overreach uh, and uh, and a process whereby parents are presumed guilty uh, rather than presumed innocent, uh, where anybody, you know, even somebody who, who clearly has uh, Bad, may have bad motives, can anonymously call in to CPS, you know, say an ex-spouse or somebody, somebody who's trying to get custody, uh, the neighbor that just got mad at you, right, can, can call in anonymously and say, oh, you know, they can make something up and CPS will show up at your at your door and you'll basically be presumed uh, guilty until proven innocent. They'll do invasive searches. They may even take the child away until they've come to a conclusion, which is very harmful to the child. There was a, a recent case where a Texas mom was, you know, sitting on her porch while her children were riding their scooters on a quiet cul-de-sac and the neighbor saw the kids out there without a parent, you know, right next to them called CPS and the officer came to the door and found the woman on the porch. And she said, Oh, well, there's been some mistake. I'm, I'm, I'm right here. I'm on the porch. I'm watching them. It's a quiet cul-de-sac. It's completely safe. And nonetheless, she ended up being arrested, was put in jail overnight. Uh, she was later cleared. Uh, but it's ridiculous that, that the officer wouldn't just say, oh, well, that was a mistake. Uh, but these sorts of things happen all the time. Parents may end up on child abuse registries and not even know it, uh, again, because of anonymous reports and lack of transparency. So that's that's really an issue. Um, there's also an issue with uh, ideological bias. Many of the social workers uh, that are that are working for child protection services are being trained in, in ways that make them suspicious of parents with especially conservative values related to sexuality. And so if you have a, a parent of a, a child that is gender, you know, confused about their, their gender, and the parent says, okay, well, we're going to love this child and, you know, kind of support the child through this, but we're not going to go with invasive and unproven, experimental, irreversible, you know, medical treatments uh, while this child is still young and we don't know the, the, the course of of this, you know, 
gender confusion, which which most kids end up growing out of if you just if just patiently wait wait it out. Um, you know, you've had cases of parents who've lost custody for that, uh, parents who've lost custody temporarily because they don't want to encourage um, a child in a kind of same sex uh, sexual orientation. Um, again, parents who are, are are loving, you know, not not condemning or you know hateful of their child, you know, going through these identity struggles, but loving and being there with them, but simply not not encouraging. Uh, sexual behavior that is that is in fact you know not really uh, conducive to the well-being of the child. So um, those are just you know a few examples of of the threats and and it's also part of the reason why. Um, and professor, being able we're going to have to ask you to, to, to bring to conclusion here. You know, we could easily go longer here, but uh, thank you. You've given us a great overview of some of your main theses. But uh, your your talk at the Drake University. I think it was uh, animating. You provided some positive steps for, for parents to, to realize their own rights and their vocation. And so thank you for spending time with us. You're welcome. My pleasure. This has been another edition of Making It Personal with Bishop Johnson. You can hear Making It Personal with Bishop William Johnson every week on Iowa Catholic Radio and iowacatholicradio.com. Support for Iowa Catholic Radio and Making It Personal is provided by Sarah Vocations Ministry. Learn more at joinserra.org.